Good morning, Will. It is such an honor to have you this morning and to get to talk to you a little bit. Will Zeckendorf, a uh, third generation developer, also co-chairman of Brown Harris Stevens now for more than 25 years. And Will, I have known you going on nine years and you have been a mentor to me, an advisor, a complete supporter, and someone who I deeply admire. So thank you so much for being here today. It's my pleasure. Uh, Brown Harris Stevens is uh, a hugely important part of my life. Really, Arthur and I are so appreciative of all you've done the, you know, in your leadership role in the last several years to move Brown Harris Stevens forward. Thank you. Well, well, it's a team sport. It's all of us together from, you know, Hall to everybody, Richard, everybody, Alan Kersner, oh, oh, yep. Diane, everybody's been very important. Agreed. Thank Agreed. you. Yep. Thank you so Everyone. much. So, Will, share with us, take us on the journey. How did you get into real estate? Uh, well, you know, this is certainly there's a, this a very f strong family draw into real estate. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to go into the music business uh, when I was in college. Um, but I had one conversation with my father, and he had a pretty big scowl on his face. So I, uh, I joined him for about a year out of college, um, on and off. Went to business school, uh, came back, and his business was booming. And, you know, why not go there? And I went there. So I worked with him for uh, about four years, real boom time years. And uh, that's how I got into it. Your father uh, <coughs> was a big mentor to you. Sure. And one of the things you're quoted as saying in this book, um, developing my life Listen. is your father said to you what you you quoted is success is is never looking back something along those lines yep. it, exactly I, no, no I remember him saying it to me yeah no he I remember he um, he he made a terrible sale of an asset and uh, you know it was the person who bought it sold it I mean maybe six months later for double the price I said oh my god how you must be so upset he goes listen you know in this business <laughs> You make a deal, you move on, you forget about the past, and you just look forward. And uh, I would say, it, it, you know, it's a bumpy business, real estate, and I think if you stick with that, you sleep a lot better at night. Yeah, his qu it quote was, to succeed in this business, you can never look back. Nope. And I think it's <laughs> such a great yeah. uh, piece of advice. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But, you know, the Zeckendorf name is iconic, mm -hmm. uh, and it's the gold standard of development uh, today. And so, um, I'm curious to know how you know you, your dad, and Arthur worked together um, when you did finish up 515. Mm -hmm. What what was that experience like? As 515 being so iconic sure. as a building. Well, you know, Arthur has has always had this amazing talent of of laying out apartments and floor plans. He has an incredible, like almost 3D um, appreciation of space. Um, and um, you know we work we work jointly on you know finishing up the assemblage, uh, buying air rights from um, some of the neighboring buildings, uh, on on the exterior architecture, the lobby. You know, so Arthur and I have always had. Yeah. You know, uh, we work a lot together, and we also work on separate parts of buildings. Got it. Got it. Um, what about your grandfather in the United Nations? That's an, also a story that everybody talks sure. about the land. Can you? Share a little bit of that. What you, what happened during that time, or any secrets that we don't know about? I mean, th not really. He's written. It's been so well covered. Um, you know, he had planned to build what he called X City there, um, and he had Walter Harrison was his architect. Harrison, of course, had been one of the architects from Rockefeller Center. You know, I would say that probably if there was a little secret behind it, you know, the Rockefellers were definitely not. They had a tough time leasing up Rock Center. Right. Obviously, they built it during the Depression. Um, it was tough to lease, and the last thing they wanted was another five, six, seven million square feet of office space, you know, <laughs> right. it's four or five blocks due east. Um, so my grandfather had it fully assembled. Uh, he had been buying these um, um, meat slaughterhouses. That's where the whole... They called it Blood Alley or something yeah, like that? Yeah, the slaughterhouses yeah. of New York City. He didn't actually quite, he had actually um, signed contracts to acquire it all. And the Rockefellers came along, um, and it was his idea actually to um, put the UN. He read they wanted to move, they were going to go to Philadelphia, they were going to go to San Francisco. He said, they have to be here in New York City. And he started calling people, he called the mayor, he called the governor, he called his, his uh, great friend Nelson Rockefeller. And Rockefeller went to his father and they actually bought the land, donated to the UN. So that was a, now they had a double victory, right? Yeah. UN's coming to New York. Yep. They've eliminated competition for Rockefeller Center. Um, and my grandfather was very, very proud and very pleased. Yeah, that's something, that's some legacy. Sure. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. 
So, Will, to go back to development, sure. you've always been in the development business, always been in real estate. Yes. What has that meant to you? Well, I think one of the nice things about development is when you're done with the building, you can actually walk, you know, drive by it every day and see it. You know, that's, a, that's obviously a, a, um, one nice part of development. I've always wondered about my friends and stocks and <laughs> bonds. I mean, what, what, what do you what's have? other than a nice bank account, you know, at the end of the day, what have you really... You what know, do you leave behind? You know, and whereas our buildings, you know, uh, I think stand the test of time. Um, many have really changed neighborhoods. Certainly, if you ask my father, his proudest moment probably would be Zeckendorf Towers. Mm. Um, really changed Union Square, really opened up the whole downtown market. You know, I think for Arthur and myself, certainly, we've had a number of buildings that have, have really um, changed neighborhoods, brought values up, et cetera. So. Yeah, I, so let's talk a little bit about that. You know, we talked about 515 Park. 15 Central Park West, which is still referred to as the Limestone Jesus. I, <laughs> I mean, it still has the highest price sure. per square foot for a condo resale yeah. ever. 220 can't compete with no. that. Um, 50 UNP, sure. 520 Park. Yeah. I mean, these buildings, um, you and Arthur are known for being precisionists, right. for excellence. Exactly. I mean, everyone who knows, it's the Rolls Royce, you know, it's the, I say that you guys are the Rolls Royce <clears throat> developers. Um, so, can you talk to us a little bit, let's start with 15 CPW, about that project and um, what was involved. Well, it was very exciting. I, I had actually had been uh, chasing the landowner for about a decade, um, so probably starting in as early as the mid-90s. I knew one of the cousins and so, you know, every year or two Arthur and I would, you know, head over to the Mayfair Hotel, we'd meet with the owner, you know, his price was always here and the market was here. but. You know, over 10 years, his price stayed here, and the market crept up to it. So, um, you know, we put a lot of work into it. Um, the whole uh, design um, of the two towers um, was exciting. And then when it came time to bid time, our bid was the highest number by far. And um, we won the bidding on it. But it was uh, exhilarating to work on that project. It was such a special project. <clears throat> I know. I mean, the courtyard, but, everything about uh, what's it. What's fascinating about it is, listen, it sold well. It did well. Um, but it only earned its reputation after it was finished, you know, which is interesting. I wish it had earned, earned its <laughs> reputation, you know, a little sooner. We did great on sales. We had very high-profile buyers. We, we took traditional co-op buyers and moved them into condos. Um, but I, I wish the press had focused more on it while we were building it, um, yeah. not once it was finished. But that's okay. Yeah, because a lot of people went in, purchased, and then they would flip it yeah, and sell exactly. it. It made huge amounts of money. And it's still, to this day, a building yeah. where people want to live. That's an amazing building. And it's yeah. held the test of time. It has. Not it has. all buildings can say it that. Has. It has. I, I, actually, I think all of our buildings have held the test of time, you know, really, because, as you said, we put a lot of time and effort into them, and, and um, you know, we don't just copy ourselves over and over again. No, you reinvent. Yeah, exactly. So. Is there something, because you have 50 UNP, and we're going to talk mm. about 520 Park, something about fives? Or oh, I know. That, it's a good luck number. Is it a good yes. luck number? Yeah, well, we like fives. I get it. It's, it's, it's worked. <laughs> it was 50 UNP, very special project as well. Gorgeous. Special Gorgeous when building. you walk in incredible the lobby. lobby. Yeah, incredible lobby. Very special and very different. Each, you guys seem yes. to reinvent. It, was, it would have been hard to, to do anything other than a very modern building. Yeah. In an area around the United Nations that it had so much international style architecture, contemporary architecture, it, it, it called for a more modern building, and hence, you know, the Foster design. And the wall of it's yeah. just it is really a special yeah, building. Fun. And then uh, 520, which is there's only a very handful of apartments left, but such a special building, um, gorgeous, well done. Yeah, the lobby is amazing. The lobby is out of this world, and then even the amenities, but the ceiling height, the finishes, everything about that building oh. is something. The good special. news there is the remaining apartments are all the best apartments. They're all <laughs> at the top of the building, so you know we, we did good inventory management there, and, and um, you know probably expect to be sold out next year or two. It's quite an accomplishment yeah, because if you think about, there's various developers you know, who have ups and downs and they do different things, but you and Arthur have done something unique to New York City. You know, you, you keep reinventing, it's yeah. the truth, you Thank know, you. I've, so it's something to feel really great. Uh, well, we're, we're, we are pleased. All right, well, let's shift gears a little okay. bit and talk a little bit about politics. Okay. So a few years ago, <laughs> you and Greg Heim headed to Albany. A few times, I think, yeah. you went on the train to Albany and uh, talked to state senators got very involved because you saw that the trajectory in New York City 
was going to be very impactful and hurt the city, the tax legislation, those sorts of things, and you sort of rallied everybody. Um, what got you so involved? You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong, you know, left of center Democrat, um, and so, you know, I, I'm all in favor of, of reasonable, what's called pragmatic progressive politics. But what I saw happening, uh, say, three, four, five years ago, was a shift from, you know, pragmatic progressive to doctrinaire progressive. Mm. And um, it was very frightening for the business community, and still is frightening for the business community, because now we have ideology that runs political ideas as opposed to being practical and looking at numbers and, and studying the consequences of various matters. And it was a very disturbing trend three, four, five years ago. And, and so I got heavily involved in, in New York City and New York State politics. And I would say that, you know, uh, I, I was part of a group called New Yorkers for a Better Future on the last election cycle, and uh, we focused on the city council. I think we've stopped the trajectory of what I call the extreme left. I think the extreme left is is dangerous to the democratic movement because it unfortunately positions the Democrats as being way out left of uh, way off of the center the center mark. Yeah, and you're not going to build a national coalition with the defund the police movement. You're just no, not going to. Never going to happen. And so um, we we I think we stopped the trajectory. Uh, we we. Um, ran races against the Democratic Socialists of America. That's the, the, uh, these are dedicated socialists. Um, and uh, we actually won roughly 70% of our races that we focused on. Roughly out of 30 races, we won 21. Um, the socialists only won two seats in the city council. Many people thought they were going to win 14 or 15 mm. seats. Two seats is not a victory. Um, so I think, we've stopped, we, I think we've stopped the trajectory, but we still need to communicate with city, state uh, politicians that the business community is important for the city, right? You need it. You, you know, it. I mean, it's, it's just too easy nowadays for wealthy individuals to go to Florida or Texas, North Carolina or South Carolina. It's just too easy. And, and they will. And, and, they are, and they're doing it. And, you know, this last tax increase, at a personal level, I'm a New Yorker, I'm going to pay my taxes. But, so this is not a personal thing, but you had a budget surplus. Mm. You really needed to raise taxes 10%? <laughs> It was more about a narrative. Well, it, it was ideology. Yeah, demonizing the wealthy. It, it was ideology, yeah. not 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 practical, not pragmatic, progressive uh, politics, and, and and so we have a terrific battle. The business community has generally put its head in the sand. Mm. Um, I would say half the real estate industry has put its head in the sand, but half the real estate industry is taking a leadership position. You know, I'll single out, you know, Steve Ross of Related Properties has been a real leader in trying to move the conversation back to centrist democratic politics. Um, you know, I have, um, and about a half dozen others have, but we don't have a ton of support. Yeah, I think your leadership has had such an impact. I mean, you educated so many of us, including myself, yep. about the city council, how it determines the budget, oh, yeah. and how we have to get involved, and you sort of turned the lights on for everybody. But we have so much more to do. I mean, our, um, I got nine no's <laughs> for fundraising for everyone, yes. You know, if I'm raising money for a real estate deal, I get three yeses for it. I only need two yeses. Yeah. Um, so this was this was an eye opener for me. Why did we fail so often? Why, you know, why were we not? We were successful. We should have been hugely successful because our message of pragmatic, centrist, democratic politics should resonate with everyone in the business community. Yeah. But but a lot of, we have a lot of people who are just simply scared. They don't want to get involved. Of, they don't want to get in a fight on Twitter. They don't want the New York, the New York Times jumping <laughs> yeah. in against them. They don't want, you know, they just don't need it for their businesses. And, you know, these cor most corporations now in New York City, such a small percentage of the revenue actually comes from New York. They're headquartered here because they've got good workers here. People want to live here. But 99% of their business is international right. around the country. And so, therefore, what happens in New York doesn't really impact them that much. Well, so do if it does turn out that Eric Adams. Uh, does win ultimately, um, uh, it would be good for New York City. I think Eric is, is again, the most um, centrist of the, of the candidates. Um, uh, w you know, we had several fundraisers for him, um, fundraisers for him. You were a big part of it. Many of the APHS agents came to those fundraisers. Right. Very appreciative to see the brokers getting involved in politics. Um, and Eric is the only pol politician um, that I think c can, can reestablish a center. And he also has having spent a fair amount of time with him, he's got a strong backbone. He's tough. He used to be a police officer. Yeah, we just, interviewed him for the Brown-Harris-Stevens agents. Yeah. 
and they they were so impressed yeah, with him. Yeah, he's um, you know, he's going to stand up at the city council. You know, if they start coming up with some their crazy ideas, he's going to say, you know, listen, here's our budget. We're yep. not going to blow it. We can get more from less. He always says that. And and I think he's I think I'm, I'm optimistic that that he'll be a good mayor, but what's what's, what's at least Let's keep to get our the, fingers crossed. Try to, well, get, try to get the votes counted. Let's get it's, it's crazy. I mean, well, he's he's putting safety first, and I think that speaks agreed. to people. Because without safety, what do we have in yeah. the city? Well, actually, our group, New Yorkers for a Better Future, uh, did the poll that was picked up on by many of the papers that showed safety was the number one concern of New Yorkers. We were the first group to make that point mm. uh, back in, um, I think, six months ago, roughly, that safety had really come back up, um, public safety. And as it should be. Yeah, people okay. don't want yeah. either. If they're not going to ride the subways or walk the streets, we have a real problem. Exactly. Yeah. So I think let's keep our fingers crossed. Yep. We'll do. Well, we're going to switch gears Yay. and talk a little bit about wine. Great. So you are known, well known, okay. as a wine connoisseur. Uh, so t tell us a little bit about that. Where did that, I know, I think you used to share wine with your dad. Yeah, no, I started there, then kind of rebelled against it, drank beer for, in college. <laughs> everybody up until knows. I was 30, and then um, started getting back into wine collecting. Uh, it, it's a great way to meet friends. Many of my best friends are, are fellow wine collectors. I'm seeing a bunch tonight, actually. And um, not, only, not only is it a fun way to meet people, but when I collect Burgundy, the, the prices have quadrupled in the last five years. So it's been an extraordinary <laughs> investment to boot. <laughs> Well, so. for anyone who's had the privilege or been as fortunate to sit down and have a meal with you where you bring your wines or you select the wine, it's just it's such a treat for the yeah, palate. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a fun hobby. It's a, it's a great hobby, but very interesting. Yes, it is. And, and as I said, I probably now own more than I need, so <laughs> maybe have to shed some at some point here. But We'll have to have a big BHS party there we go. and bring, you'll have to bring your wines. There we go. You're also a music connoisseur. Yes. And you know... Probably, sorry, Greg's probably know more about music than Greg Heim. I do. Um, and you also have a knowledge of current music, and you distributed a, a yeah. list of yes. and critiquing. How did you get so involved with well, music? I, I mentioned I wanted to get, go in the music business when I was in college. I would I started going to clubs in New York, and you know, probably when I was underage, but that's okay. Probably around 1976, 77, I started going to all the clubs in New York. I got really into it. And I collected records my whole life. You love the Beatles. I, I like the Be I collect the Beatles. Uh, I love vinyl records. I have a massive collection, a very good stereo system, and um, it's just uh, that's a really fun hobby. Yeah. Um, and 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 yeah, I do stay pretty current. I must say, the last eighteen months a little less current than usual. It's hard um, to keep up with all the. I mean, it, I th find it hard to. There's so many artists now, and their careers are so short. I yeah. mean, so many artists release one or two albums. It's one get, hit wonders. They get all this hype, and then they kind of disappear. You know, um, but it, that, I enjoy music a lot. Music is a passion that for is, you. That is, yeah, very much so. Um, so let's talk about Curious Gourmet. Sure. Because you uh, have traveled all over. You've dined at all these Michelin-starred restaurants. In fact, you shared with me. And I visited, mm -hmm. and it was such an experience. Cellar de Can Roca oh, special. in Girona. Special. Um, how did you get into well, food that? and food and wine are yes. a natural combination. So you start drinking wine, you're probably going to become a food connoisseur. And I have about a half dozen friends um, who, like me, then we we obviously had done been to all the great restaurants in New York, and then we started going to the great restaurants, obviously in Paris. Then we figured, well, you know, let's start really traveling. So, <laughs> you know, we've traveled all through Europe. Um, actually, this this uh, this fall we'll be going to um, to back to Copenhagen and to Russia actually uh, for for Michelin starred restaurants and um, that's it's, it's, it's to a be fun able to do that. you could because you can combine tourism and eat at the and restaurants. A fun yeah, we typically don't do lunch; it's just too much. But uh, we, have, we have a nice group we go with. That's about ten friends, and uh, we had to postpone last our last trip, of course, but. We'll pick it up in October. You're so busy. How do you have time? You have music, you have wine, food, you're a developer, you're the chairman of Brown Harris Stevens. You have a very busy life. It's busy. How, how do you <laughs> juggle all these things? I, I, I'm pretty good when the, when the work day's over, it's over. And mm -hmm. I do, I must say, I do, unfortunately, like all of us, <laughs> check my emails every 20 <laughs> minutes, unfortunately. Um, I don't know, I'm just able to, you know, make it all, try to keep things reasonably balanced. Um, um, obviously, when I get super busy at work, things, get pushed pushed aside um, but it's I, I think just you know as I said I think one of the key things was that lesson we talked about earlier is you know what's in the past is the past you know and, and, and just you can eliminate about two, two thirds of things you worry about 
It's by, so true. by not worrying about what's happened before. Yeah, they, they say stress is wanting the present moment to be something it's not. Yeah. And yeah. so why stress about, and exactly. it's such a great piece of wisdom. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So do you ever turn off completely from all the chaos? That's harder to do, right? That's tough. Yeah. I'd say it's been 10 or 15 years since I've been able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth. Well, you look great yeah, for not having turned off. I mean, that's the truth. I mean, it, it's tough. It's tough to check out totally. It is because there's so many things, and, and your business and is I, so timely. And I, yeah, I can. I mean, I had someone recently didn't return a phone call for six days and said I was somewhere with no internet service. I, I probably can't do that. Yeah, it's hard to do that. Yeah. It's hard for all of us yeah, to do that today. Yeah, yeah. So, Will, maybe 20 years ago, I don't remember when the whole, when people, the industry was trying to come together in real estate after you bought Brown Harris sure. Stevens and to be in control of our information. And you exactly. were one of the pioneers or one of the voices that said to everyone, let's own our own information. Exactly. Let's have our own system, yes. our own listing system. Mm -hmm. How did you, I mean, we ha can fast forward to today. Sure. And what you said back then was, you know, you were on the right path. And unfortunately, a lot of people weren't. Um, and here we are today. How do you see today and where we're going to go based on what's happened with the aggregators like Street Easy? and our lack of being in control of our information. Yeah, I, I, listen, I think, Bess, you probably think more on that question than I do. Um, you know, what, what, I, what, what I think a little bit about is where does the traditional broker fit into the process? And every statistic I've seen um, says that the use of real estate brokers has only increased um, in the last five years, not decreased. Yes. And I have heard now since I would say one, we, if we bought Brown Harris Stevens in 1995, if I had a dime for every time I've heard <laughs> that you know the real estate broker is going to be disintermediated, I'd be I would have checked out by now yep. because I, I I would not be working. Um, it, it, it's been constantly predicted, and the reverse has happened. And I think that the answer is that real estate remains a one-off, tricky purchase. Mm. It's the opposite of commodity. Every single home, every single apartment is different. Um, the information that tends to be out there is reasonably accurate, but not totally accurate. And brokers offer amazing advice to people. And, and you can't replicate that. So therefore, um, I think there is absolute room here for the traditional broker in the sales process. Um, and I've seen no evidence whatsoever of, of disintermediation. You know, trust me, there are people who want to see it happen. Yes, of And course. there are massive forces trying to make it happen. But that's been true now for 20 consecutive years. That's so, I mean, as you said, <coughs> real estate is an emotional commodity. It's tough. It's very, and it's, it's sacred, your space. It's tough. And it's, you I see the most extraordinary business women and, and business people make billion dollar decisions without blinking. When it comes to buying their home, I get these panic phone calls <laughs> from these hugely wealthy people I don't know if I should go ahead. <laughs> the market may go down. It, it, you know, it, it, it makes no sense in the scheme of things. Yes. Um, but it's just, as you said, real estate is emotional. It's different. It's a long-term purchase. And I think the real estate broker is, is a very important part of it. So yep. anyway, it's interesting. I, uh, um, I agree. It is interesting. What, is there any advice? Look, we, we have, we're in different states. We're in Florida. Yep. We're in New Jersey. We're in Connecticut and New York. We just got, th we're getting through the pandemic. Half of America is now <coughs> vaccinated. Yeah. New York is in a comeback, exactly. other places. Any advice that you would give to real estate professionals today? Anything that you would share uh, that you think they should consider or think about for the future? You know, I, I probably can't say that. I mean, you know, what we consistently see with, you know, t better producing agents is, is it's a very professional business and, and it requires total focus. It requires you know, um, um, real commitment to your customer. Um, it does require a bad memory at times because all, most deals don't happen. Um, so, so, you know, so well said. It requires, and, and, and um, you know, I, th I think not wasting your client's time too. I, I see that happen unfortunately too much sometimes. You know, your clients are busy. Yep. You know, a focused approach. What is, you know, think ahead of the game. What is the perfect apartment home for my buyer? Yep. And, um, you know, I, th I think that, that yields results. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know. You're on that path of, yeah, well, yeah. Some, some brokers, you know, show properties that they just shouldn't show. And then the broker, the customer gets frustrated. and Right. The know. best agents are able to decipher totally. and not waste time. Totally. Resource the listing yes. system. So you led the charge uh, and developed resource with a team of yep. everyone. You know, people who are here. Sure. We sat on the 12th we floor. Did. 
for and 18 months, yeah. And you, you faced a lot of headwinds, oh boy. including oh. second guessing, including from me. Oh yeah, no, and everyone. I mean, I would say that was one of the loneliest uh, projects I've ever undertaken, thankless projects. I don't think I, <laughs> no. still waiting for my first thank you on it, but um, <laughs> yeah, well, that was a tough one, but that's okay. I, I mean, it, it was clear to me that, that, that we needed an, a new technology uh, for, for the listing system. Yep. You know, um, um, would I do it again? Probably not, um, because it was about two years of, of time. Um, but I'm, you know, very thankful. And also, and now it's it's the platform of the industry. You sold it to Douglas Salomon and, and Corcoran, Corcoran. Yeah, Corcoran. and they're using it. And 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 um, it, it's very happy we did it, and we control. Our, you know, we do have yeah. good control of our data finally. And and so, listen, I'm glad we did it, but but that I, was I don't think about it too much anymore. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting because there was a time, you know, you we had a discussion and there were some, you and I faced, had yeah, a little bit yeah, of tension. Yeah. But uh, I had tension, tension with everybody on it. That's but it okay. w but it's how you learn and grow, at least for me. Mm -hmm. And I remember something you said to me, which I used throughout sure. my career. Sure. You said to me, Bess, you have to fight with the army you have, yeah, not the it. one you want. That's it, yeah. And it's like <laughs> the lights went on for yeah, me. Yeah, sure. And it was such an oh, important yeah. piece I, of I advice. Say, yeah, I would say they, on that one, you know, I would say 95% of the people I think thought we were going to fail. Yeah. You know, so there were definitely some lonely moments in that one. But yeah, uh, but you, you but persevered. I think uh, it was your, the focus that you had. You were unrelenting. We were, we, you we, were unrelenting. We, there was no plan B. There was no plan B. We had to get that system done. We had to get it working and operating. And it was, it w the headwinds were ferocious. Yeah, but um, you did that. But people don't like change either, right? I mean, we go through all the time. I no, mean, there was a petition to oh, keep Real Plus every, going. Everything. Oh, my gosh. I mean, uh, and that was the least of it. You should have seen the other headwinds I faced on that one. But listen, I think. Um, That's quite an accomplishment. Let's plant, plant, plant the victory in, in, in the sand and move on. Move I think on. a lot of people would say thank you, including yeah, myself. No, listen. Uh, it was a big. It was a team effort, but it was a tough one. It was a tough one. Yeah. But we now have a, a really good listing system. Yeah, we so did. We're right. thankful to you. Interesting topic to talk about. So, Compass <coughs> stock is now down thirty percent, and I think the IPO started off even thirty percent than what they expected. And they expected forty or fifty dollars a share. Yeah. Does this surprise you? So you know, I was. I thought a lot about Compass over the years, and and, and you know, they've done certain things well for sure. And certain things were a myth, always. And and I, th I think you know if you if you kind of end up where myth and, and facts come together, where it's trading now probably is not a bad price. Um, you know, Compass was never a technology company. Um, Compass was buying market share, and when you put those two together, it's very very hard in today's business world to buy market share and have negative margins. Yeah. And, 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 and then rectify those mar margins, you know. So, so uh, I'd say that, that it's ended up kind of where it should. Remember, the vast bulk, they spent $2 billion, and they're now worth what's called $4 billion. That In the private equity world, that's not a great return. Right. It's a 10-year company. That's, that would not be viewed as, as a successful investment. For, I'm sure the founders did great, but the people who put money in the company, so-so investment. Um, but they bought some very good companies. You know, and so they, they paid a lot for them, probably paid too much. Yeah. Um, but the market bailed them out to some extent. So it was primarily an acquisition vehicle to buy companies on the West Coast and, and, and in, the, in the mid US. I think they've done a good job of branding. I do think that. Yeah. Um, you know, the technology, as we've all said, it was never there, uh, never will be there. Um, but uh, I think it's probably fairly priced at about where it is. I think it's trading now at about 1.2, 1.3 times revenue. Uh, as I said, I, I, th I think it, 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 it was a lot of smoke and mirrors. Um, and now, listen, now they got tough. They just lost two hundred million dollars in their That's first quarter of, of earnings. Um, they got to at some point. Wall Street's going to say, "We're not going to keep feeding you. You know, yeah, you've got to I mean, run yourself like a professional, um, brokerage competent firm. brokerage firm." Because that's what they are, is a traditional brokerage firm. We've always said that. That's what they are. They're trading like one now, too. Yeah, exactly. They're not trading like the technology company. Redfin yes. trades at seven times revenue. Redfin is viewed as a technology company. Compass is a brokerage. Compass is, is, is viewed by the market, as we always said it would be, as a traditional brokerage firm. They raised a lot of money. They bought a lot of companies. And they ended up as a reality too. Yeah, it's a very different place. We've had agents who <coughs> left here to go there yeah. and have come back, and they share lots of stories. Yeah. You know, it's it, people want to be here because we're focused oh. on real estate. And then listen, we're focused on real estate, and we're focused on brokers. Yes. And at some point, you get so big, you're you're a factory. 
Exactly, exactly. So, so uh, Will, in the quarter century since Brown Harris Stevens uh, came under your watch, has there been any surprises or anything that surprised you the most uh, during your tenure here at Brown Harris Stevens? Ooh, good question. <laughs> um, you know, we haven't really talked about the property management division, yes. but, but that's been a great turnaround story. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's been... Tell us about that. Well, when we bought it, it was a tremendous money loser. I mean, it, and the management business was ruined. Because remember, bro firms had taken management at a as a loss leader, and then they had a kind of exclusive on the building. Well, mm. that, you know, yeah. you know, as, as, as Edward Lee Cave would tell his customer, you know, who do you want, many, who do you want selling your apartment? The guy takes out your garbage or, <laughs> or me? So th that, that broke down. And so, but we were able to, under, we had, under Paul Herman's guidance, kind of really turn that into a beautifully run professional company. Um, you know, in, ter in terms of the, of the brokerage, um, you know, meant, meant, uh, I would say that um, um, we've only done, continued to do great things in, in Manhattan, you know, Queens and, and, and Brooklyn. Um, I would say that uh, at times some of the ter outer territories, uh, markets we've expanded into have been great successes, and, mm. and some have been challenging. You know, that's just it's part that's of it. That's just part of the business. I mean, um, uh, it's just it's just the nature. Every market is so different. That's it. It's very local, and also so different. The splits are vary in different places. So and, different, and and, and 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 so it's been an eye opener. You know, on the positive and the negative at times. A learning lesson but for I'm, sure. You know, again, I'm, I'm, I am really happy that we're in the you know we're in five states and and and. Um, yeah, and we have those territories because it was a great, you know, it's a great feeder for all the businesses. Definitely is. It definitely is. Uh, what <coughs> are your predictions for the next year? I have, I have no crystal ball. Um, you do have a crystal but, ball. But um, I would say that um, you know they're pumping so much money into the economy right now at a federal level and a state level uh, and a city level that you know I think the, I think the I think the um, we have tailwinds behind us finally and. Uh, Let's hope September the office workers come back. Yes. I think it's it's really ridiculous that so many corporations have not brought their workers back into the uh, central business district. Yeah, they you need know, to. I mean, many companies did in June, but too many companies pushed it off until, until the fall. And now's the time. And uh, I'd like to see I'd like to see Midtown. Yeah, get people back, back up to work. For the restaurants, for the food carts, for the everyone, you know, for everything. Just to create the employment, um, it's still too empty. It's still um, too empty. Yeah. And listen, I, I have no major position on this um, because I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in the apartment house business, not, you know, or home business, not the office sector. I th prefer working in an office myself. Mm. I do too. I feel like a professional. When I'm at home, you feel like an oh, amateur. Yeah. I, I, I work from home yesterday. I, I'm in the office four days a week. I've been in the office four days a week since June of 2020. Um, I'm so much more productive here. Um, I can tune out all the noise of the home. And uh, I just don't understand why more corporations haven't brought their workers back. Okay, go to a four-day week. Yeah. You know, maybe that works. Maybe that's the right thing. You know, some industries can do remote work, and I agree that might be attractive for some people to work in Boise, Idaho, or something <laughs> like that. But, but I, I, I really would like to see. Yeah, people come back. You come can't back. build culture <clears throat> on a Zoom from home. You just you, can't do it. You just can't. And, and, and so anyway, so, so listen, Brown Harris Stevens, thank you, Beth. Thank you, everyone, that Brown Harris Stevens did primarily come back in June of 2020. Everybody's here. And, yeah. you know, thanks to that, I think we've had such a fabulous. Um, we've had it. We're closing 15, out the second quarter. 50, it's, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been monumental. It's been, it's been really, I mean, obviously, you know, COVID took its toll, but certainly since, you know, September uh, of 2020, it's been it's up, been. up and away for, for Brown Harris Stevens. And so I think that's part of the coming, coming back to the office and getting back to work. What do, what do you think, what do you attribute the pre-pandemic, now post-pandemic, this, it seems like there was like a deprivation. People are out there and they want to spend. Is that what you attribute a lot of this to, the buying? You know, I think, I listen, I, I think, um, you know, we always knew the market is segmented. There's always a need market, need, death, divorce, taxes, right. family, right. right? There's always a need right. component to our market, and then there's a, a want component. Um, you know, I want a bigger apartment, I want this, I want that. So I think to some extent the need component did get um, postponed six months, let's say, from March of 2020 until September, October of 2020. Um, and I think we, we picked, we, we caught that back up. And, you know, I think we're seeing the need buyer, the, the want buyers come back too. I want a bigger apartment, I want this, I want that. And I think, um, you know, I think something about it that pandemic teaches people is you're going to commit to a place. That's right. 
and all the younger families are committing to New York because of the school system, you know, the, the private schools, um, the education, all the uh, all that New York has, yep. and that most states don't have. Um, and once they commit, I think the pandemic has taught them that you, know, you want a bigger home, you want a nice home because, you know, you may not you enjoy it an forever. Exactly. And so, and so I think that's been driving a lot of it. So I think it's both, both of those two markets coming together. Um, and let's just hope again, let's hope the, the work, all the workers come back in September. I agree with you. It seems like there was sort of this universal reassessment of how we live. You know, people started to say, do I need an office? Right. Do I need outdoor? And so right. all of those things. But it's been really, what I would the comeback has been so immense. It's Yeah, and you can follow the office REIT stocks, you know, and um, they've been an extraordinary success story. They got obviously devastated by COVID, mm. but um, they have the better ones that fully recovered which says of the, the Wall Street market saying workers are coming back and the office is here for the future. Yeah. So um, we need people to come back. We, Tiffany's we made everybody come back. Uh, it's, it's just, I just uh, I, I understand what happened in, in 20 um, in, in 2020, but I, I really don't understand. Now it's time to get back to work. You know why to... everyone did come back in June. Yeah, so. I agree with you. It's time. It's, it's time. definitely time. Let's, let's do that. So, so Will, I know that your father was uh, an important mentor in your life. Are there any mentors? Um, that have impacted you that you want to mention? Several. Um, you know, I, I had the privilege of working with I.M. Pei directly. And, uh, you know, he really showed me the importance of listening to your customer, um, not having airs about you. I worked with him on the uh, Four Seasons Hotel with Robert Burns, who was the founder of Region Hotels. And I.M. would come to meetings, he would listen, he'd come back a week later, and he had trans he had taken what Bob had said and put in the drawings. Wow. And he really um, brought Bob's ideas, you know, to, to life. Um, so certainly I.M. Pei was a, I was a real privilege to work with, um, just a beautiful human, human being. Mm. Um, you know, Stanley Stahl, another individual, forgotten today, uh, but a, you know, my, my father was um, a creator. I wouldn't say he was a, a businessman per se, um, but Stanley was a very clear thinker about making money in business um, and, and making hard-headed decisions. And, and so, you know, I, I did a couple of deals with Stanley and, um, you know, he was very, uh, very um, um, influential on me on, on, the, on the business side of business. Um, so those are two actually extreme people to talk <laughs> about, but, but wow. those are, are two. You've been fortunate to have those sorts of people to influence you sure. in, in your leadership. So, well, well, thank you so much for today. We're, we're, we really appreciate you sitting down, sharing all this information with everybody, and um, hope you have a great summer, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Bess, and thank you, everyone at Brown Harris Stevens, for making this such a great company. Thank you, Will.